My name's Daniel Henderson, as you heard earlier, privileged to be with you again today and to be back in the Gospel of John. I understand it was a wonderful Easter Sunday last week. God's at work here. It's a joy to be a small part of it, and uh, thank you again for the privilege. Our ministry's called Strategic Renewal. I was a senior pastor uh, for most of my life, decades, and uh, now I serve as a spiritual pyromaniac, uh, coaching pastors, helping churches, and very much focused on the role of prayer in spiritual renewal and awakening. And uh, we've had the privilege of actually having Josh in one of our coaching groups and Ron and uh, doing a lot of things with you here. And it is a privilege. Our ministry is, again, strategicrenewal.com. If you go there, you'll find out about a couple things I want to mention to you. One of which is I want to invite you to go on vacation with me this summer. Isn't that nice? Now, you have to pay for it, unfortunately. Uh, but it's to Alaska. And we're doing an Alaska cruise this summer. And we're very excited about it. It'll be like a renewal conference on water. Uh, it's the only state I have not been to, so I can't say my motives are altogether pure. Uh, but our board wanted to do this to connect with some of our supporters to have an extraordinary spiritual experience along with the beauty of God's creation. And uh, we're going to be having a special uh, prayer focus called Forgive Us As We Buffet Our Bodies. That'll be the prayer of the week, uh, but it'll still be a lot of fun. So you can get information on that at our website. We're going to have flyers up at the end info table at the top lobby as well. And then coming up here just in a, a short time here this month, right in Denver, uh, is one of our prayer summits. It's a Rocky Mountain area prayer summit. There'll be people coming from all around, really, the region. It'll be held at Brave Church, which used to be Harvest Bible Chapel. Uh, it's up on off of Hamden. But we would invite you to come. be a Thursday night through a Saturday noon. So you're going to have to take... I'm, but a lot of big ask, man. I'm going to ask you to take your vacation with me, take a day off. But you know, if you don't ask, you don't receive. So might as well put it out there. We'd love to have you join us. Extraordinary experience of what we call scripture-fed, spirit-led, worship-based prayer. And some of you say, man, I can't even pray five minutes, let alone a couple days. Well, if you come to that, you will be much more equipped to experience what God wants for you in the area of prayer. And we, again, would encourage you to join us uh, for that. Today, we continue in the series, really the final message in the series out of John called Redefining greatness. And we'll be looking specifically at uh, John chapter 13, verses 1 through 20. So I invite you to find your Bible. Turn there. There's an outline on the back of your worship folder where you can follow along as well. And our message today specifically is titled, Aim High, Go Low. Would you pray with me as we prepare to study for God's Word? Let's pray together. So Father, now we look to you as we have been doing in worship we are asking, just as we have spoken words of praise to you, that you will now speak words of truth to us. I pray that your servant uh, would be granted understanding, unction, and utterance, Lord, understanding to, under, to, to say and know what you want me to say, to say it in the power of the Spirit, and to make it clear to your people. And I pray that it will fall on fertile soil, hearts that are open, wills that are yielded, minds that are attentive, ears that hear. And Lord, may we leave here better equipped to live transformed lives and to share the good news of Christ with those we encounter. And we pray this for his glory. Amen. Amen. A couple weeks ago, my wife and I had the privilege of vacationing in Florida, a place we'd never been, called Marco Island. And as we were there, we discovered it's one of the best shelling beaches in the country. Now, some of you think that doesn't sound very exciting, but for us, that's a big deal. My wife loves the shell. I enjoy doing it with her. And so we were pretty elated about this, and we came back with bags and bags full of shells, large and small, colorful, all kinds of shapes, amazing specimens of God's creation. And as normally the case, you, you love to share moments with others. So we were wanting to share this fun shelling experience with our kids. I tell you what we did not do. We did not send them an email explaining the shell shells. You know what we did? We sent them pictures, didn't we? And you know, when, when words just aren't enough, a picture is worth a thousand words. And you see that on your screen. And it's so true. Uh, imagine someone, uh, you have a refugee ministry, one of those refugees who has never uh, even understood the, J the Grand Canyon. Uh, so pop quiz, would you give them a two minute speech explaining the Grand Canyon? Or would you show them two minutes worth of pictures? Well, the scientists say, well, I'd give them a speech because I explained the geography and geology and all that. No, uh, most of us would show them pictures because, again, a picture is so powerful. 
To this point in John, Jesus has been doing a lot to explain to his disciples the essence of his life, his mission, his journey to the cross. But in this sermon, we are going to see that he gives them a picture, a picture that's worth a thousand words. And not only a picture, but an experience with him in that picture that allows them to truly begin to understand more clearly what it's all about and truly to prepare them for what they will someday face. Now, officially, Israel has rejected Jesus as Messiah. And now uh, the uh, reality of his crucifixion is coming to a culmination. He gathers with his disciples in an upper room, which is really the calm before the storm, the day before he dies. Now, I don't know if, if you knew that tomorrow you were gonna die, and not just die, not just fall over dead, but I mean suffer and die. I don't know what would be on your mind. But I tell you, I would be thinking about self-preservation, give me some pain pills, get me through this. Jesus is thinking about one thing, and that is his love for his disciples and his desire to show them the degree to which he is gladly going to sacrifice his life because of that love. Now, as we walk through these 20 verses today, we're going to kind of take three approaches. You'll see it, three main points. The first one I would call overview. The second thing we'll do is walk through, and the third thing will be application. Or to make it more relevant, we're going to start with kind of a Google Earth perspective. We're going to see this, in a sense, through heaven's lens, just real quickly. And then we're going to walk through the text, kind of from the perspective of the disciples, uh, you know, if you ever take selfies, sometimes on some of the cameras, you can also add a little quip like, uh, I'm happy or happy birthday or celebrate or something. And we're going to talk about the quips that they would put on their selfie in this upper room moment, just to kind of make that clear. And then lastly, we're going to look in the mirror and make some, make some applications to ourselves. So uh, that's the summary, Google Earth, selfie and mirror. How about that? All right. So let's begin as we walk through it. In this moment, from heaven's perspective, I would suggest, Jesus was really doing four things, and this is going to be quick, so write fast if you're taking notes. First of all, he was aware of this ultimate moment in history. In fact, I would point you to verse 1 and verse 3, and there are some phrases you'll see, he knew and he was knowing. And this is important because it gives us the, the mindset, the framework from which Jesus was about to do what he was going to do. It says in verse one that Jesus knew his hour had come to depart from this world. In other words, he knew the cross was imminent. Circumstances were obviously building to that moment, but as God, he knew what was about to go down. He also knew that Judas was about to betray him. And in verse three, he knew that the father had given all things into his hand. This was not happenstance. This was the authority the father had given him as the son of God to come to earth to secure the salvation of man and then to go back to God. So really he knew um, where they were in time. He knew what was about to happen. He knew who he was. And it was not out of a position of desperation or spontaneity. It was out of a position of strength and in intentionality that Jesus was about to do this. Secondly, he knew that uh, this was going to be, he was really setting a personal example. He was setting a personal example for them of servanthood and of really being a slave to others. And we're going to see that. Thirdly, again, by way of overview, he was teaching an ultimate spiritual lesson. Some of you are asking, we'll talk about this in a moment, is this just about foot washing or is there more behind this? Hold that thought because there is more behind it and he's gonna give them a lesson that I think will equip all of us to live differently today. And then finally, he was pointing to an ultimate supernatural mission. If you glance down briefly, and again, we'll get there in a moment, but in verse 20, Jesus says, truly, truly, and whenever you see truly, truly, it's like he's saying, here's the real point, guys. I say to you, whoever receives the one who sends, who I send receives me. Whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. So he's basically saying to them, this is all about sending you out on a mission, much like the mission I have been on, and that's the overview. So Jesus is fully aware of what's going on, why it's happening, who he is. He's going to give them an example. He's going to teach them a lesson, and he's going to send them out on mission. Now, 
To capture this picture, I want to quote another smart guy. You know, when I read a smart guy, I realize I can't say it as well as this guy did, so I'm just going to tell you what this guy said. And a great commentator named F.B. Meyer captured the essence of what this story is all about so beautifully, and I want you to see it on the screen. It appears now, I think. All right, here it is. It says, he rose from his kingly throne. Okay, Jesus is about to rise from the table. He laid aside his garments of royalty. He's about to lay aside his outer clothing. He took the towel of humanity and he wrapped it around himself. After that, he poured out his precious blood and he made possible the cleansing of his disciples. And because he was truly human and divine, he was able to complete that which he commenced, that which he started, to perfect them with the humanity wherewith he was girded. This is all about the story. What we're about to read is the story of how Jesus came from heaven, lived as man, put aside his glory, became a servant, and conducted a spiritual work in the lives of people that would transform them for eternity. So you got that? That's the overview. Google Earth. Now, in just a moment, we're going to do a selfie with the disciples. But before we do that, I just want to ask the question that a lot of you are probably thinking, what do we do with foot washing? Is this telling us that, uh, you know, every time we have communion or baptism, we got to wash one another's stinky feet, you know? Is that the deal? Uh, and nothing wrong with that, and some churches do that, but I want to tell you that there's something deeper here. And so here's the question, is this just a foot washing scene, or is this as a normal practice, or is this a picture for us to really apply? Let me say three things very quick. You don't have to write these down. I just want to help you see these. First of all, Jesus' purpose in this whole story was to teach a truth, but as we're going to see, it's a truth that they didn't get. Now, if it's just about a foot washing, they get that because they did that all the time. That was very common. I mean, that would be like, you know, washing your car to us. It's just a normal thing we do. But there was something going on here that they were not getting beyond just foot washing. Secondly, you're going to see that Jesus talks about a cleansing that was not about foot washing. It was about a, a, a deeper story of washing. In fact, he will go on to say uh, that you're not all clean but he washed all their feet. So how do you make sense of that? Well, it was about a spiritual washing that included everyone except, I bet you can guess who, except Judas. And so this is really about a spiritual washing. That's what Jesus is really talking about. And then he uses this lesson to point toward his death and their calling as his servants and apostles and sent ones. So again, just to make sure we've got the overview, this is really what was going on. And by the way, Contrary to baptism and foot washing, I'm sorry, <laughs> I blew that one, baptism and communion, uh, we never have a teaching that we're supposed to keep doing this in the church. Now, it's a great lesson, it's a great moment, uh, Jesus is going to tell them to do this kind of thing with one another, but we're never commanded to practice it, and if we get too fixated on the act, we might miss the lesson. So let's walk through. The disciples are in the upper room with Jesus. They still think he's a king who's going to set up a, an earthly kingdom. And he's still trying to help them understand, guys, that's not what it's about. I'm coming, yes, as the king of kings, lord of lords, but as the suffering Messiah who's going to give his life for the sins of many. And so from that perspective, I want you to see what the disciples experienced. If they were taking a selfie, one of the inscriptions on that selfie would be this, they were deeply loved. They were deeply loved in this moment. Let's pick up at verse 1. Now, before the feast of the Passover, they are celebrating the Passover feast. We would call it a Seder. Some of you have gone through that before. When Jesus knew that his hour had come, as we saw, and that he was going back to the Father, notice this phrase, having loved his own who were in the world, and then notice, he loved them to the end. Now, that's not a chronological statement. Uh, that's a statement of quality and of passion. It literally means he loved them to the uttermost. He loved them to the fullness of love. But let's be honest. I mean, we see that word love, and that can mean a whole lot of stuff, can't it? I mean, today as I was driving in, Josh called me uh, from the retreat, said, hey, thanks for speaking. I'm praying for you. He prayed over the phone, and we exchanged brotherly love. He said, I love you, man. I said, I love. But what does that mean? Am I just glad you're helping me out or am I glad because you're Josh and you're cool? Or What does love mean? 
Well, I'm glad you asked. That's a great question. So uh, let me give you my definition of love, which I think is biblical, and I've said it over the years, and it is this. In fact, I want you to read it with me, if you will, all right? Here we go. Love, an act of self-sacrifice flowing from the heart, produced by the Holy Spirit for the good of others and the glory of God. That's what Jesus was doing to the ultimate degree with his disciples. He was engaging and about to engage in an act of self-sacrifice that was flowing from his heart, that was produced by God's very spirit in and through him for the good of these disciples and for the glory of God. All that to say, that's the love with which we are loved. Aren't you grateful? Aren't you grateful you can't do anything to make him stop loving you? You'll never do anything to cause him to love you any more and any less. He loved them to the perfections of love and that was evidenced in the cross. And if we have experienced the message of the cross, we too are loved at that same level. And that's life changing. What the world needs now is love. Remember that one? Yeah, that's what the world needs now. And we have received it and we are now messengers of that very love. If they took another selfie, this one would say, humbly served. Pick up again with me in verse two. Now again, as a matter of context, this week, and I, Josh may have pointed this out, but during this last week, they had been staying in Bethany, probably the home of Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. Uh, that was about two miles away from Jerusalem, walking back and forth, and in their sandals, guess what happens? Their feet get dirty. If you've ever worn flip-flops or sandals, you know that it keeps your feet from getting hurt, but it doesn't keep your feet from getting dirty. And those roads in those days were filled with layers of dust, often puddles of mud. And so it's very characteristic, as you know, anytime you entered into a Jewish home, there was a pot of water, and the lowest slave in the house would be responsible to immediately go to the door and wash the feet of those who came in. It was the most dismal duty of a slave. Now, the disciples knew they were supposed to have a servant's heart. Jesus had been teaching them. In fact, just earlier he had told them, if you want to be great, then become the slave of all. And ironically, rather than thinking of washing one another's feet, if you look at the, the conjunction of both John and the other gospels, while this is going on, they're having a debate about who's the greatest. And Jesus is telling them, don't be like the Gentiles. If you want to be great, you got to be the servant of all. I'm among you as one who serves. But it still does not occur to them that according to the custom of them all having dirty feet, that someone ought to do something. So what did Jesus do? Well, you know the story. It tells us in verse two that during supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, again, knowing the Father had given all things into him, he'd come from God, was going back, rose from supper, and he laid aside his outer garments. Now, let me unpack that just for a moment. Back in the day, they had two, two kinds of garments. They had outer garments and undergarments. Kind of like us today, right? Most of you, thankfully, showed up in your outer garments, and we're grateful for that. Uh, if you come to the volunteer thing, you want to be dressed like Jesus, just wear your outer garment, please, all right? But he took off his outer garment underneath. It's almost like a long T-shirt with nothing underneath. This was, honestly, it was his underwear. It was, it was basically like, not to be, uh, you know, weird, but he basically stripped down his T-shirt and his boxers. And so he does that. He takes a towel ties it around his waist, and this was, again, kind of the clothing of a slave in a home. And he poured water into a basin, began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Now, let me mention something here. You, you notice the reference to Judas. You might say, now, why'd they insert that there? Because Jesus washed all of their feet, even who? Even Judas. Now, I don't know how you respond when someone betrays you, I don't know how you've reacted lately to someone who talked about you behind your back or someone at work who intentionally did something to hurt you, someone that has angered you and, and made your life miserable. I tell you what Jesus did, he washed his feet. And that's a picture that we can't forget. That's why Jesus made so much about forgiving people. That was the power that allowed him as he hung on the cross to say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's why we even have the power to not only forgive people, but to bless them. Bless those who persecute you. Why? Because we are a different kind of people 
because we are followers of Jesus Christ. And so he served them in customary fashion by taking the position of a slave and washing their feet. Notice thirdly in this selfie, you would see the little phrase patiently taught because now Jesus begins to unpack a lesson that they're not getting and yet he patiently makes sure that they are set up to understand what's going on. Let's pick up in verse six. He came to Simon Peter. As I studied it this week, um, most commentators think there was probably a bit of a vying about who's gonna sit next to Jesus because they're still worried about greatness in his kingdom and probably wound up being John, who we know, and probably Judas. Uh, Peter's probably at the other end of the table, which probably serves him right. Uh, but he finally gets to Peter and Peter said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? In other words, no way. You're not gonna wash my feet. Jesus answered, said, Peter, what I'm doing, you don't understand now, but afterward you will understand. Again, it wasn't just the act of washing feet. It was the lesson and the meaning behind it. Peter said, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Now notice Jesus didn't reference feet this time. He said, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. Jesus is talking about a spiritual washing that would be profound and life-changing. So in that case, Peter said, well then, not my feet, my hands, my head. Typical Peter, he goes from one extreme to the other. Don't do it, then, then hey, go for it, right? But in Peter's mind, it just didn't make sense that Christ, who was gonna establish an earthly kingdom, would be humiliated like this. But Jesus is basically telling him, Peter, if you don't let me do this, you don't understand who I am and why I've come. And so he now moves to this spiritual lesson from the physical illustration, as he often did in John. Uh, you remember as Josh has been teaching you, he would use pictures to illustrate spiritual truths, wouldn't he? He said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Well, he used the idea of birth to illustrate a spiritual truth. He spoke to the woman at the well about water that was literally about transformation. And now he uses this picture of washing to speak to them about the ultimate reality of salvation. Let's continue verse 10. Jesus said to him, the one who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And so let me just capture that. Jesus is saying, once you have been cleansed, you don't have to keep being cleansed. Now you may have to wash your feet. So here's the application to us. If you've come to faith in Christ, you are forgiven, you are clean, you are pure, you are righteous. That's the power of the cross. But let's be honest, we still keep picking up dirt, don't we? The temptations of the world, the attacks of the devil, and so we have to continue to come to God in confession to restore that intimacy, to walk in that purity. And that's the essence of what Jesus was saying. Now he says, and you are clean. He's making a statement about what they would experience through the cross, but again, not every one of you, because again, he knew Judas, verse 11, would betray him. That's why he said, not all of you have experienced this spiritual truth. And then pick up in verse 12. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them again, do you understand what I've done to you? Do you understand the meaning of what this is? So again, he is patient, but he is teaching them a great spiritual truth in this moment. Now, their fourth selfie, uh, in terms of capturing this moment, would say authoritatively called, authoritatively called. Pick up in verse 13. He says, now, you call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, because I am. I'm your teacher, and I'm your Lord. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Now, you would look at that and think, well, then this is just about foot washing, but here's the point. Look at verse 15. For I have given you an example that you also should do just, and here's the key word in the Greek for what it's worth, as I have done for you. So it's a difference between saying do as I have done versus doing what I have done. In the Greek, the idea is in the spirit of what I've just done, keep doing that with one another, not just repeat the act. And so Jesus now is calling them to be servants, to be humble, to be sacrificial, just as he has done. Now, again, I don't want to throw foot washing under the bus because there are moments when that can be very... Have any of you ever had your feet washed by another believer? Some of you have been. Maybe that was your church, maybe tradition, maybe spontaneous. And that can be a very humbling, evocative moment. 
I remember a number of years ago, I was leading a prayer summit for, a, a, probably, I don't know, 60, 70 pastors in, in Little Rock, Arkansas. This was a Monday night through a Wednesday noon. And on Tuesday afternoon, uh, much like we'll do here later this month, we were spontaneous scripture reading, singing. The Lord was working. We were all very united, engaged. And I can't remember what was happening at the moment, but out of the corner of my eye came the pastor of the largest predominantly white church with a towel and a pail of water And he called to the middle of the room the pastor of the largest African-American church. Now, if you know much about Little Rock, they have a history of significant racial tension and divide. And much of that had already been broken down through their praying together, their love for one another. But in this guy's heart, that wasn't enough. He wanted to express abject humility and servanthood. And as he wept there and washed the feet of this pastor, he said, I want to more aggressively honor you, support you, put your church above my... I mean, it was a moving moment. People were crying. And then that pastor got up called a a, a Hispanic pastor to the middle of the room and washed his feet. The African-American pastor washed the Hispanic pastor. Hispanic pastor, after this cry session, gets up and he calls a Chinese pastor to the middle of the room and washes his feet. Now, this was not some superficial, hey, let's do this because we got to. This was an expression of the heart, right? I think one time when I was pastoring in Minnesota, it was missions week. We had two men from the Middle East one of whom was a pastor in Iraq. People in his church were being killed by terrorists. His family was being threatened. He lived under literally the risk of his life. And we had brought them in in order to, to understand what they were doing, to support their ministry, etc. Spontaneously in an auditorium of 4,000 people, this pastor, this man from Iraq, brings out a pail, uh, a bucket of water and a towel. And you see the picture here. He makes me sit down in my younger days. And our missions pastor sat down. And in front of thousands of people, begins to wash our feet and we could do nothing but weep. You see, there are moments when this kind of expression could be very real, but it really is not again about the act. It's about the heart, isn't it? And so again, verse 16, as we wrap up our walk through this passage, notice what Jesus says. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. He's basically saying, I want you to live like me. I want you to serve like me. I want you to see opportunities like this, just as I have done, in order to exemplify the gospel. And in verse 17, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. He's basically saying, never get too big for your britches. Always be a slave to others. And by the way, keep in mind, these guys are about to superintend the biggest spiritual revolution in history. At the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people come to Christ. Pretty soon, it's 5,000 men. By Acts 6, commentators think it's 20,000, and then they multiply greatly. And so what's to keep them from tweeting their own greatness or, or tooting their own horn or, or getting high and mighty or starting websites they named after themselves or whatever it is, right? All the stuff we do, it was that they were marked by this picture of the one who they served who came as a slave to, in humiliation, show real love to others and it changed their life. Verse 18, I'm not speaking to all of you. I know whom I've chosen. Again, 11 out of the 12 here. But that the scripture may be fulfilled, who ate my bread, ate this bread and lifted up his heel against me. I'm telling you this now. And here's what's interesting. He says, before it takes place, so that, not so that you'll get ticked off at Judas, but so that when it does take place, you will believe that I am he. So all of these events are pointing to the reality of who Jesus was, how he lived, and next week you'll get into the betrayal of Jesus. Finally, in verse 20, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me. Whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. Again, those words, truly, truly, so evocative. Later on in John 20, he's gonna say to them, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. In other words, The same intimacy that I have with the Father that has put me on this mission and the same authority I have from the Father that has sent me to this earth is the same intimacy you will enjoy with me, 
Incidentally, not incidentally, profoundly through the Holy Spirit, because you're going to talk a whole lot about the Holy Spirit later on. You're going to see this in these next few chapters. Through the Holy Spirit, that same intimacy and that same authority, he says, guys, this is just so you can sit here and look at the selfies. This is so that you will now go out into the world as servants in humility and with genuine sacrificial love in order to fulfill my mission. So now we stop and we say, what's this mean to us? What's the application? Well, let's look in the mirror just for a moment, all right? Because of this picture, because of this moment, we must, as our sermon is titled, we must aim high and go low. We must aim high and go low. And can I just say personally, there's one verse in this passage, and maybe you picked it up, that really haunts me. It really challenges me, actually. It's in verse 17. Jesus said, if you know these things, blessed are you if you take good notes on Sunday morning and you have warm fuzzies when you walk out of here. No, blessed are you if you, what's it say? Anybody know? If you do them. You see, the blessing is in the obedience, isn't it? It's not just in the knowing. It's not just in theory. It's not just in feeling. It's in doing. Blessed are you if you know them. And let's be honest, we live in a culture that is full of ego, that is full of self-interest. We promote ourselves, we praise ourselves, we talk about self-esteem, self-love, self-this, self-that, et cetera. And it is self that destroys the fabric of society, isn't it? Every broken marriage, every broken family, every struggling relationship, always there's a problem with self. And so Jesus is saying, you wanna know blessing? then live this way. It seems so counterintuitive, doesn't it? Because the world tells us, oh man, you want to be blessed. It's all about you. Climb to the top. Build your kingdom. Do your thing. You know, develop your platform. But Jesus says, if you really want to be blessed, you do what I have done. Give yourself away for other people. Wash people's feet. Be a servant. Be humble. That's where the blessing is. Therefore, we must aim high and go low. Three final thoughts. Number one, we need to aim high for cleansing, the cleansing of a holy life, and go low to the lost with a message of forgiveness. In other words, this whole passage was about the incredible truth that we can be clean, we can be forgiven. And we need to continue to aim high out of that reality for a holy life. Now, if you're here today and you feel far from God and you don't know if you've ever experienced forgiveness, you don't know if all the sins you've ever committed in this life could be forgiven and taken off of your record by the power of God, that's the message of this text. Jesus can wash you and make you clean and give you new life and make you pure forever. But if we are believers, it says to us, we need to walk in that purity day by day so that we can share the message of forgiveness. The people at your work, the people you'll interact with this week, their greatest need is to know that they can be forgiven of their sin. Secondly, we need to aim high for this example that Jesus gave us and go low by serving the needs of others. Go low by serving the needs of others. Some people have asked, well, what's the equivalent of foot washing? So I Googled that this week. Some guy said the equivalent of foot washing is washing somebody's car. Really? Uh, The equivalent of foot washing is scrubbing somebody's tires. Okay, go for it. That's nice. Someone said it's cleaning their toilets. Hey, that's that's all good. I would just simply say to you, the equivalent of foot washing is to be aware in the moment of what you can do to put yourself second and to put someone else first. The equivalent of foot washing is just to have the mindset of Jesus and to follow the promptings of the Holy Spirit this week to do something for someone that is sacrificial and that honors them. And so in your marriage, husbands, wives, children, parents, in your work, there's an opportunity to do this all the time. And I would be honest with you, Jesus says, blessed are you if you do them. And wouldn't you agree with me that There's nothing more miserable than, in a sense, being a Christian, being saved, having a head full of knowledge, having a heritage of faith, but not doing what Jesus said. Not doing what Jesus said. Living without the blessing. Living in frustration, emptiness, self-effort, a sense of futility, failure. Jesus is saying here, guys, if you want to be blessed and happy, this is the pathway. And what an opportunity we have to do that. 
So again, Jesus said, the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. I find most conflict in marriages and in churches because someone has the expectation to be served and they weren't. But that's not who we are. We come out of the security and identity of Christ's followers with a mindset of service. One writer you see it on the screen, T.W. Manson says it this way. He says, in the kingdom of God, service is not a stepping stone to nobility. It is nobility. It's the only kind that is recognized. And what a privilege to understand that's who we are in this earth. And by the power of Christ in us, we can live this way. Peter Marshall said it this way, small deeds done are better than great deeds planned, right? So it's not a matter of going out here, oh, I'm going to be a foot washer, you know, and you put 10 goals on your paper, or on your wall. No, it's just about being aware in the moment of the small things the Lord wants you to do to exemplify the gospel. I, uh, I hope that this week God will bring this picture to our mind over and over and over again. I, I think of a personal illustration. When I was in college, uh, I had kidney stones. I've had them numerous times through the years. It's a lot of fun. It's like a, a man having a baby that's holding barbed wire, basically. Uh, I had kidney stones. That's a good picture. Talk about pictures. But anyway, um, I was in the hospital, far from my parents, you know, new at this school, and a buddy named Joe came by. He had bought me a really cool pair of pajamas, so I didn't have to walk around with that thing flapping, as you know. Uh, he brought me a cool pair of pajamas. He washed my hair. I had hair back then, actually, all right? So uh, he, he actually washed my hair as I'm in this bed and I can't get up. And then he stayed to have dinner with me, read scriptures, encouraged me. Boy, that was foot washing. And Jesus said, blessed are you if you do them. No surprise, uh, today Joe leads a, a ministry called the Network of International Christian Schools. They have Christian schools all around the world, a budget of $36 million. Blessed are you when you do this. Not only the joy of serving, but the blessing of God on your life. Finally, well, let me say this one quote. I, I don't want to miss this. Gordon McDonald said this, you can tell if you're becoming a servant by how you act when someone treats you like one. <laughs> Isn't that a good thought? And so if you're going to be a servant, be willing to be treated like a servant. And that's okay, because that's who we are, because that's who Jesus was. Finally, Aim high for the reward of eternity and go for a life of sacrifice on earth. Uh, we we kind of end where we began. Jesus knew right at the outset that he'd come from heaven, he was going back to the Father, and this scene was all understood through the lens of eternity. So let me give you a, a little phrase that's on my, gonna be on my, not yet, but gonna be on my tombstone someday, all right? And it is this, the scoreboard's in heaven. Would you say that with me? The scoreboard is in heaven. Being a servant, pursuing humility, giving your life to others is not always easy, but it is always worth it. Because God's keeping score, he never misses a call, and his Scorekeeping is absolutely perfect. So I want to encourage you, if you apply this message, it won't be easy some days, but don't lose your focus on eternity because if you do, you'll stop serving. You'll decide it's not worth it, it's too inconvenient, and what a tragedy it would be to squander the vapor of this life and to give away the privilege of reward that God has for us as we serve him according to Jesus' life. As we close, we're gonna do something that the Bible tells us to do, and that is to give some moments to the public reading of scripture. So I realized this week, Paul wrote something in Philippians 2 that is perhaps the ultimate commentary of John 13. I'm gonna ask you to stand with me, and we're gonna read this aloud together. We might pause just for a moment here and there and insert a prayer. The team's gonna come and begin to play behind me. But I want you to read, this is Philippians 2, 1 through 11, and not the normal version we're used to because I don't want the familiarity of it to, to cause you to miss what's being said. So we're gonna use Eugene Peterson's take on this passage. And I'm gonna ask you, if you would, read this aloud with me, all right? Here we go. If you've gotten anything at all out of following Christ, if his love has made any difference in your life, if being in a community of the Spirit means anything to you, if you have a heart 
And if you care, pause right there, pray with me. Lord, thank you that these ifs are true for those of us who know you. And what a stewardship we have, God, to know that we're in a fellowship of the Spirit, that we have experienced the love of Christ, that you give us capacity to care, that you put within us your own heart. Oh, we thank you, Lord. But we want to to live that way. So help us even now as we read. Let's continue. Paul says, then do me a favor. Agree with each other. Love each other. Be deep-spirited friends. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. Let's continue. Think of yourselves in this way, the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave and became human. Continue. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death, the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. Would you pray just for a moment? So Lord, let us not forget this picture this picture that signified all that Jesus came to do and all that he was and all that now he empowers us to be and to do. Lord, help us apply this to the person we're standing next to today, a spouse, a relative, a friend. Help us be like Jesus this week as we walk among a lost and broken world. And Lord, we would tell you right now, we can't do this, but thank you that Jesus would remind these disciples that he would put his very spirit in them and he would live his life through them. So Lord, would you do that? For your glory, we pray. Let's conclude. Because of that obedience, God lifted him high and honored him far beyond anyone or anything ever so that all created beings in heaven and on earth, even those long ago dead and buried, will bow and worship before this Jesus Christ and call out in praise that he is the master of all to the glorious honor of God the Father. And let's say together, he is the master of all. Would you say that with me? He is the master of all. Say it again. He is the master of all. Once more, he is the master of all. So teacher, master. Help us to live like you for your glory. And thank you for the promise that blessed are we as we do this. Help us. We need you to live like you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen.